lovely, that's great, excellent, excellent. Um, so what I'm going to be covering today in this uh, presentation on um, basically embodiment as a theoretical tool in the study of religion, gender and sexuality. Um, I want to explore what we mean by embodiment um, and where embodiment has been situated within the sociology of re religion, um, but also what um, a somewhat different perspective from a queer feminist perspective, what that might look like. Um, and I also want to end um, on some um, new theoretical agendas as well. Um, so what I'm basically uh, drawing on is uh, some of the publications that I've been working on recently. Um, so uh, predominantly uh, this presentation will relate to the embodying religion, gender and sexuality edited collection action. Um, but also I'll be drawing on um, the Religion and Sexualities book, which is the bottom one I co-wrote with Heather Shipley, and also Intersecting uh, Religion and Sexuality that I wrote with Andrew Yip, and that's, um, that's another edited collection. So what do we mean by embodiment? Um, we experience the world through, um, through our bodies, and um, this has an enormous impact on how we navigate uh, the world. Um, so as Housen says, we, we do not simply have bodies, but we are bodies. So the body is central to our social experience as well. Um, but in, so that sort of might be quite an, an, an obvious statement to make about you know, how we, you know, how we experience bodies, but bodies are never neutrally defined. Um, so bodies get classed, they get raced, they get gendered. Um, bodies get catalogued and categorized. So we do not have ultimate control over how our bodies are read. Um, and I really um, welcome the work of uh, Pua, who did a fantastic study some years ago of the UK civil service um, and argued that, um, that there is something called the somatic norm, the normative body, and that's the body that gets deemed neutral in society. So that body is the white, male, middle-class, able-bodied, heterosexual, cisgendered body, and other bodies are deemed less in some way against that sort of um, um, schema. So as Poir says, some bodies are deemed as having the right to belong, while others are marked out as trespassers who are in accordance with how both spaces and bodies are imagined politically, historically and conceptually circumscribed as being out of place, not being the somatic norm, they are space invaders. So that's quite a powerful idea, you know, this idea of certain bodies being situated as, as space inv invaders. So when we look at um, where religion has been situated in terms of the body, I guess one of the most um, significant texts um, has been Brian Turner's Body and Society. And as a, so, so this was uh, a work that was, was really part of the rediscovery of uh, the body within sociology. But as a sociologist of religion, um, Turner had religion at the forefront of, of his analysis. And, you know, given that we often encounter lots of disciplinary disconnections between religion and um, the theory within sociology and religion, as has been explained uh, by people like Jim Beckford. Um, it, it's interesting that actually this, this really key text, um, there was so much about religion in it because of um, Turner's own interests. And the book has been extremely influential. There's numerous new editions that have emerged. And a key issue that Turner covers is the ways in which bodies have been controlled in relation to religion, sorry, in relation to, to sexuality and gender, and how that has being channeled through religious processes. So for example, Turner examines how um, re religious ideas fed into inheritance processes in, so in medieval society, for example, anyone surplus to requirements um, in the system of primogeniture could be sent to the religious houses as a monk or a nun, for example. Meanwhile, property was passed through the male line with women acting as uh, the subordinate players in all of this um, and their value was determined through their breeding capacity as well as their sexual purity. So you've got a high concern and interest in issues around virginity uh, and the control of women's bodies um, as well as uh, Christian and this is often uh, rooted through the Christian concept of sin for example. 
Now, as society changes, um, Turner is mapping how this system is upended by uh, new economic processes, enlightenment thinking, and increasing secularization. So in a capitalist system, Turner argues that um, a greater level of disruption is allowed in terms of family formations. So the system can cope with more disruptions such as um, higher levels of divorce um, and, and that becoming normative and, and women having greater rights such as access to the economic sphere in their own right. But my, my issue with, with Turner's analysis is um, the way in which he, he presents a rather optimistic uh, view regarding what the implications are for gender and sexual autonomy. Um, and he has little time for a feminist analysis. He's pretty dismissive of feminist approaches. And Turner instead argues that patriarchal systems have been severely eroded. Um, and because of secularization processes, religion then having little impact on the control of bodies. So there's, there's less of a focus on the sort of um, the, the everyday sexism and the, the, the structural nature of that um, in the contemporary uh, moment. So, um, the, the book that I've um, edited with, with Katie Pilcher that um, well, it was published the very last day of last year, um, but it's, it's formally a 2021 publication, um, is actually how um, bodies are structured through um, heteronormativity. So heteronormativity is a valorization of, of heterosexuality, and that is a structuring experience. So um, I guess conventionally you might think that heteronormative, if, if you're valorizing heterosexuality, then that's going to most severely um, impact on queer bodies and the regulation of queer bodies. But heteronormative, the, the heterosexual, uh, heterosexuality itself has its own hierarchy. So um, it's also regulating all bodies within the system to, to determine the extent to which you are living up to the ideals of heterosexuality. So you can actually have um, even a you know quite a um, a, um, a, a queer supportive society, but at the, the root of it still has the sort of valorization of heterosexuality. So you know one of the key criticisms of same sex marriage, for example, is the idea that this is um, promoting a certain view of of, of heterosexuality, um, and it, it's creating a pit particular value system and, 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 and a new hierarchy, even though it includes more bodies, but there's still this um, um, system that, that um, you have to sort of live up against. Um, so heteronormativity is, is negatively impacting queer bodies and as well as, as women's bodies because women's bodies um, carry the symbolism of communities. So um, it's on women's bodies that virginity codes have been written. Where meanwhile, queer bodies have been sanctioned um, through social systems that either deny queer bodies a space at all, um, or relegate them to inferior subjectivities. Um, and it's interesting where religions lie in that, because um, although religions are often presenting themselves as having, um, always having a, a, um, a continuous um, understanding of sexuality, there are these changes that you can note. And one of the changes that, you, you know, you can note, for example, in, in some forms of conservative Christianity, for example, is how um, it might not be uh, the full denial of a queer body, but um, you, you might have um, certain sanctions on what you are allowed or not allowed to do. So, for example, celibacy. So the queer body is expected to be celibate, um, for, for example. Um, so, you know, this, these are sort of kinds of morally appropriate uh, sex that are mandated by by certain conservative uh, traditions um, that end up causing harm. So, um, you know, one example being queer people who are told to be celibate within their religious communities. Um, also, uh, theorists like Patricia B.T. Young has talked about how um, Christian marriage where vaginal sex is prioritised um, for its procreative assumptions, uh, downplaying um, sexual pleasure um, and the, the harms um, created there as well. So because heteronormative structures are wide ranging, Pilcher and I have um, separately argued um, for a, a queer feminist approach. So uh, we don't delve into it in this particular publication, but um, Katie Pilcher has written about it in her own publications. Heather Shipley and I wrote about a queer feminist approach in the um, Religion and Sexualities book. Um, and the, the, the the reason for that is that it's it's recognizing the structuring system of heteronormativity as impacting lots of different 
uh, groups. Um, so rather than sort of separating out queer analysis, gender analysis and so forth, it's about sort of bringing um, that together and, and pulling that all, all together. So we didn't have space to specifically um, explore that within uh, the, this particular book you're seeing here on embodying uh, religion, gender and sexuality in a very short introduction that we had. But ultimately, this is the starting point that we, we both have that's underpinning this. Um, I've got intersectionality and live religion on there. I'm gonna min I'm gonna come back to those. I'll I'll, um, I'll mention those again uh, in a little bit. So, what um, Katie Pilcher and I do in the introduction uh, to uh, the embodiment book is we conceptually frame embodiment in terms of six different uh, processes and um, the, 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 how we've come up with these six um, facets of embodiment is uh, really in conjunction with um, the, the, the book as a whole. You know, we've got lots of different authors in that book, lots of different perspectives. And, um, you know, it was sort of our communal thinking about how we understand embodiment in relation to, um, uh, you know, to, to those chapters. So I'm just gonna take you through the, the conceptual framing and the different facets of the conceptual framing now. So the first one is space, and I've already started to reference space given um, Puar's work on bodies out of, out of place. So when certain bodies enter particular spaces, they're not welcome. So um, space relates the extent to which uh, bodies are enabled to fit or not within a given space. And um, we take the view that, that spaces do not just exist, um, out there, but spaces are socially constructed. We don't believe space, spaces are neutral either, but, um, but spaces are infused with certain boundary maintenance. So who gets included and on what basis and who gets excluded? So we use Poise, I've already mentioned the somatic norm, um, and just to remind everyone, the somatic norm being the white middle-class man, and everyone gets measured against that somatic norm. So our theorization is, is basically about, you know, who gets included and who gets excluded. But in relation to space, you've also got time and how time also structures and how time is also something that's socially constructed. So if we think about Western time in relation to gendered and sexual bodies, Western time is understood in very linear terms. So one is born, one grows up. Uh, one gets married, one has children, one dies, and then the cycle um, continues. So it's very much tied to a reproductive cycle. Um, and that's a very heteronormative structuring of life um, that religions themselves have had a vested interest in because, you know, it's religions that are often utilised at key moments within the life cycle, whether that's the birth of a child and particular ceremonies surrounding that, uh, whether it be marriage, for example, and, you know, a, no, not all, but predominantly, you know, that there's a huge amount of investment in things like heterosexual marriage from religious traditions. So Bollestorff calls this um, straight time, the straight time model, um, and how this is, this is sort of structuring um, experiences of bodies. So I, I guess it doesn't go without saying that we're starting to also hint at power and the role that power is playing in the regulation of bodies. So power is fundamental to understanding embodiment. So, you know, you can look at Foucault's work, for example, on the confession and how the narrative of the confession brought into being uh, the naming of sexual practices. So the priest would make a decision regarding whether the practice, the sexual practice was licit or illicit. Um, so um, basically this divides uh, sexual practices between um, the normative and the deviant, uh, and it's the power is rooted through the priest in this uh, ex example to, um, uh, to, to, to to make those decisions. So that's sort of the historical approach, you know. But we can look at the contemporary manifestation of power and how mm. uh, powerful discourses emerge. The fourth um, facet of embodiment that we have is relationality. So relationality is about how bodies communicate and relate with, with other bodies. Uh, and I'll quote um, Pilcher and myself now. Um, we say, relationships form the basis of how we understand ourselves, what is important and what is ethical. Um, so, you know, how do we understand what is inappropriate and appropriate behaviour? So that's something that's devised collectively, the collective norms that are relationally produced. But at the same time, we've also got, um, you know, that sort of sexual activities that are, you know, they, they can take, you know, often take a relational form. 
Projects of the self um, is the fifth um, element. Um, so that's about the, uh, the body work that we do and the process of discipline that we place on the body. So the way in which the contemporary subject is far more responsible for their own discipline and the self-regulation there. So we're all regulating, re regulating our own bodies and you can follow the sort of the historical trajectory of that, going back to Norbert Elias's work on civilizing processes, for example. And this is a recognition about the sort of the socially constructed nature of, of the project of the self, that where the body is never a finished project, it's always socially constituted and becoming, it's becoming something. So we're constantly changing and, um, you know, the, the sort of the, the becoming uh, the becoming body um, being central. Um, and that also uh, points to questions regarding the extent to which our bodies are aligned with our identities, how we modify the body um, and how, you know, I guess that question of, you know, our individual choices in, in relation to the broader structures uh, in which we are uh, find ourselves. Um, and the final component that we've got for, for understanding embodiment is the projects in, in particular relation to, to, to religion is the projects of religious and spiritual communities. Um, so bodies are crucial for communities themselves to be created and um, religion, religious and spiritual communities um, have um, enact borders uh, and who is inside and who is outside of those borders. So gendered and sexual embodiment uh, becomes crucial lenses through which the community body as a whole is read. Um, so just to pull on an example from, from my research, what was really interesting is um, when um, young people who came out as say gay or lesbian to their parents in, in conservative traditions, um, the parents might actually be accepting of their child's sexual identification. Um, and the parents say, well, we will accept you, but we cannot let anyone in the community know about your sexual identity. Um, this would cause problems, this would cause issues. So at an immediate family level, um, the identity of the child, the sexual identity of the child is accepted, but it's about that more broader community censorship um, that's, that's going on. Um, and you know we, we found this quite a bit within the religion youth and sexuality project we did 10 years ago that um, i did with andrew yip and, and mike keenan um about community center and control of bodies um and you know that the, the sort of um and, and other work as well of course i mean um a, a project that i'm frequently using in my own work is bernadette barton's book pray the gay away um and um she's writing about the bible belt in the united states and the, the collective geography of belonging uh, that continues to censure and control the queer body. So the repercussions of not fitting in and how this sort of pervades the whole of um, social life within that particular geographical context. So what did this embodied approach allow then? Um, so the book itself is divided into three different sections. And I'm, I'm not gonna have space to sort of talk about every single chapter, but I'm just gonna give you a flavor of how we structured this the book. So the first theme that we explored was um, how, if we, we're taking uh, embodiment and the body as a central starting point, it undermines a strict demarcation between religion and the secular. And this idea that bodies are complex entities that do not fit neatly into either a, a sacred or a secular box. So Brenda Bartlink and Yellow Wearing, for example, um, I think you're on the call, so uh, hello to you both. Um, look at the Dutch sexual healthcare programs and argue that the um, educational programs that are set up in a confession style manner um, is seen as, as, as sexually beneficial and, and that the appropriate and right way of delivering sex education. Um, but they argue that that's underpinned by secular normatives, assuming that religious ways of approaching sexuality are backward in some way. Um, and this idea that constructing the classroom um, in these sort of more secular uh, terms is, is a much more progressive approach. But what they're um, analyzing is the, the, the harms for religious participants and, and the, the lack of recognition of those harms from the secular educators. Um, so this, this, the educators are trying to coax the, the sexual story out of religious um, individuals, to use Ken Plummer's terms, um, but you know the, the, the negative consequences of that. 
Um, and another chapter in the book, Lika Shrivers, looks at the experiences of women who have converted to uh, religions like Judaism and Islam and how uh, this generates particular negative assumptions about them and what their perspective is going to be on uh, equality issues in relation to gender and sexuality. So there are, th there's this assumption that, se that religious space is always going to be negative uh, to sexual and, and gender equality failing to capture the diversity of um, real religious bodies. The second part of the book um, is looking at and examining power regulation and resistance. So Katie Pilcher's chapter, for example, um, examines orgasmic meditation. So orgasmic meditation, and she's examining this in the United States and also in the UK, um, as a complex uh, practice that enables bodily trauma to be um, addressed, for example. So, you know, th th this is a, a, a means of um, being able to uh, sort of seek control when something really negative has happened to the body. Um, and orgasmic meditation, for those um, that aren't familiar, it's um, it's a goal-oriented exercise uh, that's in very um, strict conditions uh, where the clitoris is stroked uh, for, for a set period of time under very specific conditions. So it's a very, um, you know, interesting uh, community of practice. Um, and, and what Pilcher is examining there is um, that old norms about the body can be challenged, but at the same time, newer, new path configurations can be can be identified as well. Um, and, you know, with with the gendering of bodies being at the center of that. Meanwhile, Joe Henderson Marigold looks at how the cis body has been dominantly constructed in existing understandings of biblical texts. So Henderson Marigold argues for new readings of um, biblical characters. I mean, in this particular case, uh, Henderson Marigold is examining Jacob and the story of Jacob and how the sacred text has been regulated in a particular way because of the way it is understood body. So this dominant construction of bodies has ha had an impact on the hermeneutical readings of the Bible there. The third um, part of the book examines uh, body symbolism and the symbolism of bodies. So Alison Halford, for example, is examining uh, the experiences of reproductive failure uh, within the um, the Church of the Latter-day Saints. And so women who do not have children, and there's this um, expectation for motherhood runs so high within this community, you know, what are the implications of that when their bodies are seen in these terms of reproductive failure? Um, and again, how one reconfigures one's body in relation to the religious community um, and how that happens. And lastly, I'll just mention George Amaka's chapter, who examines the experiences of Nigerian um, unmarried women in Nigeria and how their bodies are policed by uh, religious communities, often to harsh effects. So again, thinking about the relationship between bodies and the boundary maintenance of uh, communities. So that's taken as um, a sort of a little bit of a whistle stop tour through um, the, the book that I did with Katie Pilcher on embodiment. Um, but, you know, my thinking has been shaped through these sort of three different books that I've been uh, writing about um, that I, I uh, mentioned at the start. Um, so over the summer, you know, you sort of um, thinking about, you know, the, the implications of the different theoretical work that I've been doing and the three books, um, you know, so where am I now sort of theoretically? Um, and I guess what I'm, you know, thinking about is, is how we can link embodiment to other key theories. So um, this is about pushing the agenda harder, I guess, um, and moving this beyond embodiment. So firstly, I want to talk about lived religion. Um, and um, Maguire's been incredibly influential here. Um, so live religion, I guess most people will, will have an, an awareness of this, but live religion is, is very much a, a sort of a bottom up approach to religion. So rather than looking at the sort of authorized versions of religion, um, it's about examining religion as lived. And rather than trying to determine whether somebody is authentically living out a religious faith or not, it's actually taking seriously um, the religious practices that people engage with, so very much focus on practices, um, and, and sort of not making assumptions about whether somebody is properly practicing their religion. So I guess the easiest, you know, the way that I um, explain this often to my students, and I guess this is um, a, a well often utilized idea, is when you're looking at um, 
uh, the um, papal encyclical banning artificial forms of contraception. But when you have um, Catholic populations who have access to artificial forms of contraception, it's typically utilized. Um, so this is a disjuncture between what the, uh, the church authorities are saying one should do and not use uh, contraception uh, versus what uh, Catholics on the ground do. So rather than saying these individuals are being inauthentic Catholics or uh, not, you know, not doing their Catholicism properly, it's actually uh, trying to understand their perspective and their positioning um, and taking that seriously and not sort of how, you know, trying to measure them up against some uh, list of, of religious edicts that they apparently should be following. So it's very much this lived bottom up um, approach. Um, and in terms of how this links with embodiment, um, I mean, there's lots of people that have, have taken a live religion approach, uh, but Maguire has done a huge amount to sort of situate embodiment and lived religion together as linked concepts, um, emphasizing that religion is experienced through real material bodies with socialization processes, for example, uh, being heavily embodied, you know, so when one is socialized into religion, how that's a really embodied process. So just to quote Maguire, she says, human bodies matter because those practices, even interior ones, such as contemplation, involve people's bodies, as well as their minds and spirits. Material bodies are also linked to spirituality through healing, sexuality and gender, through fertility, childbirth and nursing, and a myriad of other forms of embodied practices. Meanwhile, an intersectional approach is invested with understanding the complexity of how social inequalities get reproduced. So it's moving beyond a class only, gender only, ethnicity only framing to instead recognize identities as enmeshments of privilege and disadvantage. And although a lot of the early work, you know, coming out of the uh, black feminist tradition um, was very much interested in the multiple oppressions experienced by, by black working class women, for example, um, intersectionality is about this sort of how inequality gets configured um, and the differences that result depending on those uh, alterations in one's identity. So how, the experience of a working class white woman um, and a black middle class man, how their experiences of discrimination, inclusion and exclusion are going to differ um, in, in, in certain ways. But it's, you know, Andrew Yip and I point this out in our, our book about how intersectionality has not really been utilized in the sociology of religion. It's a cornerstone idea, particularly within feminism. It's often utilized in sociology but um, it hasn't been um, as, as readily utilized within the study of religion. So um, that's the introduction to live religion and intersectionality. So, you know, what do we do now? So what I'm proposing um, by pushing the agenda further is to think about these as linked concepts. Um, so intersectionality, lived religion and embodiment as interconnected, interlinked, concepts. So I'm just going to take you through that. Um, so I've already noted Meredith Maguire, I've already sort of talked about this element of the, of the, the cycle, where we've got live religion and embodiment uh, in tandem with each other. Um, and, you know, Meredith Maguire's work does that very well. Um, next, I want to talk about Heidi Merz's work, who has theorised embodied intersectionality. So embodied intersectionality is a means of conceptually heightening and extending the concept of intersectionality. And I'm just gonna quote Mirza now. And she's uh, looking at Muslim women. So, you know, her framework, her analysis is focused on Muslim women. And she says, embodied intersectionality not only seeks to theorize the complexities of race, gender, class, and other positional social divisions, as lived realities, i.e. how the women experience the world holistically as a Muslim, middle-class, heterosexual woman, but also interrogates how this experience is effectively mediated by the body and lived through Muslim female subjectivity. Thereby, by centralizing the body, it becomes a good way of understanding the rootings and effects of power in the formation of inequality. So by bringing them together, much 
a much more powerful theoretical tool is utilized in being able to understand inequality. Now, I've already mentioned uh, the work that Andrew Yip and I have done on intersectionality. And in that book, we actually conceptually link intersectionality and lived religion. So we emphasize how lived religion can be deployed intersectionally. So we note the similarities between the concepts. Both of these concepts of intersectionality and lived religion are concerned with everyday practices. Both recognize complexity and fluidity and both take marginalized bodies seriously. And despite sociology of religion not prioritizing intersectionality as a theoretical frame, we argue that lived religion can be utilized as an intersectional concept which may also enable the sociology of religion to become more inclusive of different religious bodies. And this is important because my argument is, is that the study of religion has typically focused on middle-class identities. Christian subjectivities has also been a dominant focus. White religious adherence has been a dominant focus. And we need to move our frameworks beyond this. And this is about you know, developing a theoretical uh, means to, to do so. So we need to recognize complex subjectivities as well. Um, you know, the person who adopts multiple religious identities, who sees themselves equally as a Buddhist, as well as a Christian, for example. The, you know, who is getting missed out of our account? So you know, looking at the res my particular research field, very little on Sikhism and, and sexuality, for example very little on black women's experience of religion within the UK. And I'm sure we can all identify uh, research gaps in our own, uh, own field. So for me, um, a queer feminist approach, which is about um, the margins, it's about recognizing who's, who's being marginalized um, and de-seating de centralities of power. Um, that's sort of my underpinning approach. Um, but these three concepts for me give a really clear way and an inclusive way of doing the sociology of religion that's, that's thoroughly taking into account power dynamics. It's recognizing real bodies and it's, it's doing that in the context of religion. So I'm basically pretty much out of time. Um, and I, so I've not really had much chance to uh, really link this to some of the empirical work that um, I do, but, but I'll just briefly say, so and we can probably pick this up if you like in the Q&A, um, but um, thinking through some of the work that I've been doing, for example, on anti-abortion activists. So for the last five years, I've undertaken with Pam Lowe, uh, an ethnography of anti-abortion activists. So individuals who specifically situate themselves in the public sphere to oppose abortion. And, you know, these are highly conservative voices uh, that you don't necessarily hear in religion and sexuality research because uh, the body of research has typically prioritized speaking to those who are negatively impacted by um, conservative religious agendas and rightly so you know there's you know those stories absolutely need to be heard but again this is sort of a project in broadening um, you know what happens when we do hear these conservative voices how do we make sense of that how do we do justice to that what's also recognizing the very narrow and essentialized understandings of bodies that such groups typically um, typically maintain in relation to the body. I also want to flag up young people and children. So there's an emerging body of work that's um, recognizing the importance of taking children's voices seriously in religion research. So actually speaking, you know, designing research projects so that we're actually speaking to children. So Rachel Shilato, Celine Benoit, uh, Anna Strahan, for example. And 10 years ago, when we were doing the Religion, Youth and Sexuality Project, um, it was, you know, the, the, the importance really of, of listening, I mean, these weren't children, but young people's voices, um, who were often being talked about, but not being spoken to. So there was lots of assumptions being made about their sex education curriculum and what it was perceived that they needed to be, when actually they found this stifling and out of touch and irrelevant. Um, and actually, if we'd, we'd just spoken to the young people, it would give you a rather different perspective. And I also just want to flag up the, the emergence um, of the emerging evidence around child sexual abuse as well in religious organizations and how children were not allowed a voice and indeed were disbelieved and, and you know, just completely dismissed when they did bring, um, you know, um, the, to the attention of authorities um, at, uh, abuse. So these horrific abuses that have been suffered, um, which religious organizations have covered up, um, to protect their reputations um, as, and as a form of, of damage limitation. But in the process, 
I have put other children at risk. Um, so this is this is profound because it's it's the absolute moral failure of institutions that set themselves up as being the moral compasses in society. So, for example, the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse in England and Wales, it's generated pages and pages, you know, thousands of pages of testimony. So how much will that become part of the public consciousness and how much will that be sort of reroute, um, you know, and change things uh, to, to enable marginalised voices to be heard and to change things for the better? The news media only picks up a fraction of what ICSA is uncovering. Um, so is this a moment for the stories to be heard? or does the, the silence continue? So one of the criticisms by survivors of one of the more recent ICSA reports was that it enabled religious authorities much space to defend themselves. Um, and you know, it, it goes back to who gets the voice, who gets the power, um, who gets to define the agenda. Right, so I'm going to finish there on um, my conclusion. Um, so really, you know, what does applying a queer feminist approach to social sociology religion uh, enables us to do. Um, it's examining things from the position of the margins as, as bell hooks would, would talk about. Um, and Pilcher argues, um, and I'll quote Pilcher here, a queer feminist approach can bring to the fore how both gender and sexuality are constructed in ways that center them with hierarchical social divisions, recognizing that the power of normalizing discourses in particular contribute to reproducing structural inequalities. And for me, this is what sociology is about. It's about examining um, inequalities, how they emerge and um, a means of sort of an agenda for, for change and developing more equal and egalitarian processes. Uh, and my argument in the sociology of religion is that we can do this by linking together the concepts of live religion, intersectionality and embodiment. And there's a need for the sociology of religion to diversify, to, to move beyond the privileging of whiteness, Christianity, heterosexuality, and so forth. So the question that I, I leave you with is, you know, where do our research priorities lie uh, and what theoretical tools do we need to push our research further? And I'll, I'll finish there. Thank you very much.